Okay. Hi, my name is Kelly Santarosa. I'm a policy analyst with the AUMA, and welcome to our Joint Use Agreements for Schools webinar. We're recording this webinar, and both the recording and a copy of the presentation will be made available to you. So keep an eye on our digest article to come out either this week or next week. We'll have all the links on that. So we have some great guests here today. Um, we have Terry Gunderson here with the Alberta School Boards Association. He will be presenting first. Then Dr. Avi Havinsky with Alberta Education. Barry Beck, Jason Freund, and Don Lucier with the City of Lethbridge and Lethbridge School District will be talking about their model. And then Stacey Latimer and Carol Gerard with Lac-La-Biche County will be talking about their joint use agreement up there. So uh, let's get started. I'll turn things over to Terry, and off we go. Good morning. Um, as you heard, I'm Terry Gunderson. Uh, I'm an education consultant with the Alberta School Boards Association, and certainly on behalf of the association, I want to extend compliments to the AUMA for hosting this webinar. It's certainly my privilege to be involved. As schools are a community resource, it makes so much sense to jointly plan and jointly use uh, this resource. It just makes sense to work together. Prior to the work uh, I'm currently doing, I was a, an associate superintendent of planning and operations for Strathcona County and then superintendent of schools uh, for Strathcona County Schools. At that time, Strathcona County was a highly integrated uh, municipal education entity, and so doing uh, things jointly was just the natural way of doing things. Following the provincial changes in 1995, I became the superintendent of Elk Island Public Schools which uh, obviously was an education uh, entity. There are a, uh, a few uh, joint use, uh, exceptional uh, joint use agreements uh, uh, across the uh, province that uh, I'm aware of. Uh, as an association, we can certainly uh, point to parties to a, a number of those. As you uh, watch the webinar, our hope is that you will be inspired uh, to move more uh, dramatically towards joint use than might currently be the case. We would encourage you to be a first follower in joint use and planning agreements. What's a first follower? Well, have a look. Thank you. 
So obviously we're looking for uh, first uh, followers in terms of looking at exceptional uh, joint use agreements uh, across the province. So I spent time on a, a uh, provincial committee uh, with uh, partners as uh, noted on this uh, next slide. Uh, it was uh, particularly impressive in that it involved three government ministries as well as the provincial associations listed. Uh, you will be very uh, familiar with uh, AUMA and AAMDNC. Uh, the other uh, the others here are the Alberta School Boards Association and the Association of School Business Officials of Alberta, as BOA. Uh, Alberta Education was the project sponsor, and our next speaker today, Avi Habinski, will be chatting more about the project and its findings. I would, uh, however, like to point out uh, two uh, recommendations that were particularly meaningful to me. Uh, long-term integrated planning and joint use and planning agreements. Uh, the report was entitled Guidelines for Planning School Sites. I believe that there's great value in collaborative partnerships. Amongst provincial associations, uh, as demonstrated today, as well as locally between school boards and municipalities. As a provincial association, we've seen areas where there has been great collaboration at the local levels. We've also seen areas where it doesn't appear very visible. Two major uh, pieces of legislation uh, affecting school boards and municipalities are, are out there provincially. Uh, the Education Committee, uh, sorry, the Education Act received royal assent quite some time ago, but is still awaiting proclamation. The two key words, collaboration and engagement, appear 22 times in the Act. This is certainly an area for emphasis. And it specifically mentions municipalities as partners for school boards on a number of occasions. It's uh, my understanding as well that there have been some consultations on the uh, Municipal Government Act. Uh, it was a period of uh, time, and that resulted in a document, MGA Review, Summary of Input and Issues. I also understand the MGA will receive first reading uh, following uh, the Victoria Day weekend with proclamation prior to the elections in the fall of 2017. So there may be further opportunities for respective parties to provide input into both acts. Uh, in my opinion, that would be highly uh, desirable. A recent report by the Auditor General outlined the unprecedented emphasis on education infrastructure as a provincial program. Uh, phase one, a program that's mostly complete, uh, involved 35 new schools. Phase two involves 50 new schools and 70 major modernizations. Phase three, 55 new schools and 20 major modernizations. Uh, some additional dollars were identified in budget 2016. Uh, this uh, reflects the work that has to be done and the fact that 8,200 more students are anticipated in September 2016 in Alberta schools. So in my opinion, we have a historic opportunity to work together. This webinar is focused on joint use agreements with some reference to joint planning. I can tell you that at the spring general meeting for ASBA, uh, there will be a school site planning session that will occur on Tuesday June the 7th. I'd like to conclude by saying it seems very reasonable to explore providing the very best foundations for the process of planning for and using schools. Good morning. My name is Avi Habinski, and I'm Director of Capital Planning with Alberta Education. I've had the extensive experience with joint use agreements uh, in my previous position with, as an Executive Director uh, with Edmonton Public Schools. And uh, I'll try to provide you with some further insight on a study that we undertook and the report that the Minister of Education uh, released on February 10th, 
2016 titled Guidelines for Planning School Sites. It will focus on uh, collaboration between municipal and school authorities as well as some uh, best practices engaged, uh, engaging in development of uh, these school sites. Terry earlier mentioned uh, that uh, the involvement was quite extensive with the, of the study uh, with the representatives from education, infrastructure, municipal affairs, as well as the AUMA, uh, uh, AAMDC, ASBA, and ASBOA. I would like in uh, this opportunity also to commend the AUMA for arranging this form of webinar on school sites. Uh, the group from the outset focused on some of the principles that we believed in. One is that the schools are community assets and that municipal, uh, local school boards and the province must collaborate in this process of securing future school sites and that the roles and responsibilities must be uh, clearly defined so every party knows what they are responsible for. Uh, as well as the fact that uh, partnership and we encourage the uh, partnerships during the processes of building future schools and modernizing existing facilities to partner with municipalities, with local communities because when you do that the benefit, the benefit for the broader community is enhanced. Uh, part of the input that we received were from two sources, school jurisdictions and there were sessions that we had in Edmonton for the north, central and north, as well as in Calgary uh, and uh, with the municipalities we had three meetings in Lethbridge, Airdrie and Leduc and uh, received, we received significant important input on what stands in the way of collaboration as well as some of the issues that they would like to be addressed. Uh, the school jurisdictions shared with us that the concern of no provincial standards for school sizes and uh, there is a challenge in that because uh, we at the provincial level do not have uh, control over the delivery of school sites. We in the Municipal Governments Act expect the delivery is interaction between the municipal and the school authorities. The next one was the relationship between school boards and municipalities very markedly and what we found is uh, the number of school jurisdictions, almost all of them, have responsibilities over areas that have a number of uh, municipalities and the interaction with the municipalities vary. In some cases, the relationships are good, there is a joint use agreement, good understanding of what is, are the respective responsibilities. In others, uh, it is more reactive in nature, if at all, if there are some relationships. And when it is reactive, the school board shares the message, we just got a project approved and we would like a site that is serviced. And you can imagine at the municipal level, the reaction is, what? We need, uh, it will take uh, a few months or maybe even years to get to it and uh, our budget has not been planned based on these kind of uh, expenses. And, and the third one, the input from the school districts, uh, there are concerns about uh, applications of off-site levies because the grant that the province is providing for the construction of schools are limited to the site itself. It is the building, the parking lot, adjacent uh, landscaping, but it is not uh, creating or funding lights that are leading to the site or uh, adding a site or a lane, additional lane to accommodate traffic to the school these are not part of the allocation and school ju jurisdictions are concerned when municipalities suddenly come with it and it is not part of 
the funding that they are receiving. The concerns uh, with school sites, some of them that I identified here on the screen, uh, the topography. Uh, schools are not necessarily receiving the best sites through the developers. Sometimes it is areas with slopes that require significant investment into grading and uh, sometimes it is the lower area and the, uh, the lower area and uh, immediately you can see swamps because this is not easily uh, developable. You need to invest in it and these are the sites that end up passing on through the municipality to the school board. Uh, also issues of sites not being serviced. Um, at the present time, the sites need to be serviced in order for education to recommend that the school is going to be uh, going ahead or being going to be funded. The issue of property size I mentioned before is also uh, and it is sometimes inadequate. inadequate. Uh, some of these sites were identified uh, long ago, sometimes 15, 20 years ago when the traditional school was K-600. to six, 600. Nowadays the school districts are, are trying to build K-9-900, to you require significantly more land and there is a gap between what is needed and what is available. Uh, quality of the soil uh, sometimes is uh, a challenge, contamination, organic material, uh, stockpiles on the school property that needs to be removed before the project can proceed, and uh, playing fields. Uh, in some municipalities there is no recognition that it is the local authorities responsible, between them, responsible for the development of uh, the school site. As a result of these kind of challenges, projects are delayed, uh, the costs are rising, and uh, projects are cancelled. Uh, in the recent case in Calgary, the high school, Catholic uh, school district high school, needed to be re relocated because the original site was not uh, ready in terms of servicing the site. The inputs that we received from municipalities uh, towards this study was, uh, were the following. Uh, they wanted to have a consistent and predictable capital funding. So for a period of three to five years, if they know which projects are going to be funded, then it is easier to incorporate them in the budget of the municipality and uh, ensure that they are available in a timely manner. Uh, local obligations, uh, to make sure that uh, each party knows what is expected of them. Playing fields, who is responsible and when is it that they are needed. If existing sites are insufficient, I mentioned it uh, earlier, uh, when the school is larger than originally designed and uh, there was a feeling that if there is a commitment to a joint use agreement it results in collaboration. Uh, out of the study we ended up listing a number of recommendations and here are some of the highlights. Uh, the need to have a longer term integrated planning so that when a municipality is engaged in planning, whether it is an area structure plan or other plans, they need to involve the school jurisdictions uh, so that they can get an input into the implications of the different zoning on the number of students. And once you know the number of students at the elementary, junior high, senior high level, then you can start to plan for future uh, facilities. Uh, there is a government commitment uh, or the recommendation is for a government commitment to a predictable funding and we saw in budget 2016 government identified the Minister of Education 
identified 50 schools that are considered by education to be of high priority and the future approvals will commence with uh, consideration of these projects. Uh, the site readiness is an important one and uh, in some of the good examples that we see municipalities are now involved in signing commitments that the, the sites will be serviced in a timely manner so that if we end up approving the project we don't have to wait for too long before it could be implemented. Uh, provide guidelines to clarify roles and responsibilities and outline best practices. Uh, the comment about uh, site res readiness and the signature of a municipality guaranteeing yes we are going to work on that is a step in the right direction is identify this one of the best practices in the document. School jurisdictions and municipalities should review joint use uh, planning agreements. Uh, we recommend that at least every five years they should be reviewed and in cases where there are no agreements I think that uh, uh, the municipalities and the school authorities should consider there are many examples and we can share the examples of uh, good agreements that they could explore whether these uh, would fit their needs. So in general, the joint use agreements could accommodate a variety of different issues. One of them is the issue of the land, how much is needed, when is it needed, the again involvement of the school board in these plans and at the same time we believe also that when the school board is developing their three-year capital plan, the municipality should be part and parcel of uh, this process. So the joint planning, the responsibilities of site development and maintenance is another element. It is not only that uh, it is the land but uh, also the maintenance in the longer term. Some of the original joint use agreement and I know that the when you look at the mechanism of creating these relationships there are different committees so in the case of Edmonton Public for example or the city of Edmonton there is a committee that deals with issues pertaining to land and they have um, also issues pertaining to access of facilities so that it is community access of the gym or other spaces in the school as well as the school's access to facilities such as tennis courts and swimming pools that they are maintained by the municipalities. The collaborative mechanism, the different committees and who should be part of that and uh, finally the understanding, uh, the understanding regarding disposition of uh, surplus school land. I know that some of the, in the big cities there is a concern because some of the lands are owned in fee simple by the school boards and when they are declared surplus the, sometimes the expectations are that they will get uh, for it the market value but uh, so it is issues pertaining to this versus reserved land that ju jurisdictions get them uh, for free and the expectations are that they will return them to the municipality for other uses for free. I know that I can elaborate on many of these points and I'll be pleased to respond later on to questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Abby. Uh, we will turn it over now to uh, Barry, Jason, and Don with the City of Lethbridge and Lethbridge School District. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Don Lucy, and I will be talking to the Lethbridge School District number 51. I've been in the system for 21 years. Um, prior to that, I was vice president of, uh, of uh, finance and administration with Athabasca University. I have a fairly good knowledge of the province, as I have been um, vice chair of the Northern Alberta Development Council and uh, six years as chair of the Alberta Capital Finance Authority. Uh, so, 
with my colleagues here who will introduce themselves as we go through our presentation. We want to talk to you about our joint use agreement uh, that the city has with uh, us as school districts. So uh, we are going to proceed right now. So our agreement is, is a granddaddy or a grandmother, however you want to look at it. It's been around since 1959, the first of its kind in Alberta, actually. And at the time, it was a matter of uh, how do we maximize the utilization of tax-funded facilities, and that's both schools and municipal recreation facilities. And so that was the whole objective at that point in time. Um, schools certainly benefit from access to city-run facilities as uh, at little or no cost to themselves, and those are the skating rinks, the swimming pools, the theaters that, that everyone is aware of. When it comes to community groups, um, they're provided uh, during non-school hours with free or affordable access to many school facilities. Those are the gymnasiums, the lecture halls, and the meeting rooms within our schools. The city of Lethbridge maintains separate joint use agreements with the Francophone School District as well. So the community use of school facilities, the whole rationale was by making school facilities available during after school hours. And that way citizens of Lethbridge receive increased access to the recreational opportunities, policies and procedures. The City of Lethbridge Recreation Parks and Cultural Development coordinates all the bookings during the school year and that includes booking requests from the community and allocation of space and time. They also do uh, work with our schools to see what is available and confirm those bookings with the schools and also with the community groups. And um, they provide the billing and the collection services for all rentals. They do the statistics and they produce um, annual booking reports so that the school districts know what is really taking place. So as far as the availability of facilities are concerned, uh, both school districts make their gyms, as I said, and meeting rooms available. Weekends, holidays, 8 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. after school, 5 to 9.30 p.m. at elementary schools, and 6.30 to 9.30 in our secondary schools. Um, needless to say, school activities have priority over community use, but school, uh, schools are very reasonable in that regard, and, and so everything uh, is worked out uh, in a reasonable fashion. As far as equipment is concerned, the schools provide the sports nets and uh, individual groups are responsible to provide their own activity equipment. Supervision, um, this is really important. At the time of booking, community groups are required to provide the name of one person who is responsible for supervising the participants before, during, and after the booking. And when it comes to cancellations, we require 48 hours in advance of the scheduled time. And that helps in the, in the sense of caretaking, et cetera, within our schools. Security, we open the doors 15 minutes prior to the activity. And we ask the groups to vacate 15 minutes, within 15 minutes after their booking time. Um, caretaking, school boards arrange for caretaking. And caretaking is present during all scheduled community activities. And school boards attempt to have caretaking duties coincide with scheduled bookings. We do that as much as possible. In fact, our caretakers will work till about 10 o'clock at night so that we can cover those evening bookings. Um, and use outside regular caretaking hours, require caretaking. We then uh, have to look at approving those, and it's covered through the monies collected from the bookings uh, that the groups make. So we do have a few restrictions. Um, these are activities that are not permitted by, by community groups, and uh, some of them you're likely fairly familiar with. We don't have public dances or weddings, uh, private social events, including birthday parties, games of chance, indoor soccer, floor hockey, any alcohol-related events, and naturally, no smoking. In addition, facilities may not be used for commercial purposes by businesses or private institutions. The nice part of this is that the insurance, as far as insurance is concerned, the City of Lethbridge provides a blanket coverage for all user groups that book through the administration office. And with that, uh, we've got cost sharing. So at the end of each session, revenues are first used to replace any worn out equipment as agreed upon by the Joint Use Committee with remaining revenues returned to the respective school districts. Now, in the past, this was a 50-50 split, but 
as you're well aware, school districts are very poor, and so we um, changed that to uh, to it all going back to the school. I'll leave it to Jason. I'll leave it to Jason. We're going to do a little of a handoff here. Uh, my name is Jason Freund. I'm the Recreation Services Manager for the City of Lethbridge. And I'm just going to talk a little bit from the city's perspective on uh, how the school access to the city of Lethbridge facilities works. Um, obviously, we let them in for educational purposes, but um, we have a lot of uh, field trips and whatnot that fall outside those auspices, and they, and they still fall into this policy, so it is not purely as uh, we don't ask what the activities are when they're coming in. But nonetheless, um, in terms of availability, um, the schools have access free of charge to any of our city facilities from the hours of 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. There are activities that have to be before and after those times that there are charges that apply to them, um, so this is just a free portion of that. Um, it applies to all Lethbridge schools that are participating in the joint use agreement, and for us that is actually three school districts right now. That's the, the School District 51, the Public, the Catholic School District, and the Francophone District. So we have um, all three districts that operate within the city right now that are participating in this. Uh, during the school day, uh, the priority of the use is actually given to the school activities. So even if we would have regular bookings, um, we do give the priority to the school districts to uh, keep this uh, a joint uh, moving forward and being a positive experience for everybody. Um, supervision, uh, we do require, of course, that the schools provide the, the supervision of the kids that come to the activities. Um, we do not provide that within the facilities necessarily, um, so they do have to have the adequate supervision depending upon the ages and the numbers of the kids that are coming through. Uh, all booking procedures are done uh, directly through our administration offices at City Hall. So each school, uh, it can be any teacher representative, the principals, or whoever the class representative is, can call and book uh, with our administration individual, and we will set up the situation or whatever facilities that may be. Uh, we've talked about a lot of facilities in here. D just so you know what type of facilities we're talking about, we're, we have ice arenas, tennis courts, ball diamonds, soccer fields, picnic shelters, uh, the theaters in town, we have uh, public operated theaters, uh, city hall bookings, our adult museum, our nature center, swimming pools, and any other facility basically that you can, they can list in there. So it is a, a full complement of facilities that's in there. Uh, any one of these facilities, there is no rental fee uh, uh, for, uh, for the schools during the daytime hours, with one major exception, and that's usually at the aquatic centers where there's additional supervision required for the number of kids those fees must be picked up by the, by the schools that are coming through. Um, but if you're bringing a group and we can, we can deal with it on a regular basis with the staffing, there's no charges. Um, we also have a grounds and open space management um, portion of, of the agreement. Uh, this is split into two. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk about something that's not on the screen quickly, which is and the bookings for those fields. Uh, the schools have use of, their, of, their, of, of the fields uh, on the outside of the buildings uh, until 6.30 p.m., and then the, the city books them to the organizations, the soccer, the footballs, a after 6.30 p.m. Um, we do talk to one another, so if the, it goes before or after that time, there is, there is a partnership, uh, but the, those fields are booked under the joint use agreement as well. And in most cases, the, and all cases, actually, the city maintains um, all the fields and all the playgrounds uh, and all the school, schools, uh, so the, there is a cost sharing mechanism that's in place uh, for that. Uh, it is a, a very complicated formula uh, based on the, the hectares of the school and, and how, many, how much water is used and everything, uh, part of that process, so I didn't attempt to put that in here, but it is agreed upon on a yearly basis on the Joint Use Committee as to what those costs will be. Um, there's also ad additional special maintenance requests that go in there when we have special projects, whether that be replacing a, a ball diamond, adding another, uh, another field, um, backstops, posts, those type of things that uh, get uh, taken care of as well as a budget meeting once per year. Um, the city maintains the grounds out the back door. What that basically means is, is on, on the back end of the school where most people don't see it effectively from that point on out the doors with maybe a three meter buffer, the city maintains and does the maintenance on, on everything from the grass to fields to everything else that's out there. Um, that also includes um, all the playgrounds, as I mentioned early, earlier, that are on the back of the door. The school boards themselves are maintaining the front of the building up and including to the sidewalks to the road. So that's, that's where the sharing agreement goes from there. And I'm going to pass it off one more time. I'll be back in a minute. Thanks, Jason. Uh, this is Barry Beck uh, speaking. I'm the Community Services Director for the City of Lethbridge. Uh, I've worked closely with the school districts uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, I've known uh, Don himself for quite a few years. I used to be in the consulting engineering world and helped you, you Don design and build a number of schools, including the West Lethbridge Center, which was two high schools and a library. So it was really quite the 
the endeavor. He actually built an entire subdivision to make that happen. It was excellent. So how did that happen? How do we ever get to the point where we could actually work together to build an entire a new neighborhood in, in our west side of our, our municipality? Well, really it was the uh, really our, our jo long-term joint use agreement provided the venue or the opportunity for us to actually start those kind of conversations. Um, um, so it provided a forum for discussing these long-term, um, that particular project, but also all long-term plans that both the city of Lethbridge and the school boards are envisioning. Um, um, it's also a mechanism for securing future sites in the community development, and we have those conversations all the time, and, and, it's, and we're working on those even today. Opportunities for the school and school boards to share new construction costs are also discussed, and we'll have some examples of that in, in a little bit. Uh, the city works with the school boards, the school boards uh, quite extensively to identify sites and together work towards providing the best school sites possible and, uh, and those that are available. The uh, school boards and, uh, and the city they jointly develop mutually agreed upon schools or grounds, and each board uh, participates in the development of their own facilities. So what it starts saying is that we act, while we have a joint use agreement, with, we actually have a joint use agreement that's separate with both the uh, separate school district, the public district, and the franken homes. So we'll work with them separately on those sort of issues. So how do we get some new projects going? Well, sometimes a community, uh, school or community group wishes to propose a new project under their GE agreement, uh, and they should do so by notifying in writing. So we have a process to actually have those things enter the process. Uh, the secretary treasurer of the school district is involved, and all the letters are submitted before the end of the year, and a brief description of the project. The joint use committee will then determine whether or not the proposed project actually meets the following criteria. And you can read there on your, on your screen there, but the project provides resources presently not available within the neighborhood. And there's, we don't want to be duplicating. And if we, we if we plus always have scarce dollars, we want to make sure we get the best bang for our buck. Projects will be provide modification of existing resources, which will make it more functional, and those are of course very attractive. Uh, development concept has a minimum of lifespan of five years from final completion with a minimal maintenance and operating costs incorporated in this design. And we actually have to consider the operating costs as we all go forward because, as Don says, it's schools we often have limited funding, so we got to make sure that whatever we're building uh, has minimum impact to everybody's operating costs. And this is, I think, really important is that any of the proposed school or community are willing to contribute financially towards the development costs. And we always like to have everybody have some skin in the game. It, it just makes everybody have some real purpose. All right, uh, Jason here. I'm going to rejoin you. Thank you, Jason. Rejoin you here. Um, so how, how do we accomplish this? Uh, what's the structure that makes that happen? Uh, we have a, a couple different pieces uh, to, to move this forward, and they have different responsibilities in different areas of the agreement. So we have a joint use committee that oversees the entire agreement and makes the decisions. I, again, the, the points in the list, I'll just briefly touch on them. They're responsible for financial operational policies, developing regulations, uh, advising and communicating to, to everybody involved, uh, submitting an annual budget, coordinating the work of the technical committee, which is a, a separate committee that, that's associated with us, and I'll go over that in a second, um, implementing the terms of the joint use agreement and of the duties assigned. So as we all know, things, things come up and uh, we, we deal with it at the joint use committee level. Um, how is that committee formed? Um, really, uh, the, the base here is that we have the people that we need at the table. Um, it's not so much a numbers game with one organization or another, it's just who do we need to make things happen at the table. And currently, the way that exists is uh, both school districts provide uh, two individuals, um, one that is more operations-based and one more administration-based. Uh, the city themselves, um, Barry uh, sitting next to me here, the director of community services sits on that, a recreation and culture general manager, and the parks general manager. So basically, it doesn't matter what topic comes up, we have the individual at the table that can, can, uh, can do that. There are some very important people that also sit around the table that aren't listed on here that should be mentioned. We have our financial individuals. We have programming uh, uh, individuals from the city, the administration, the ones that do the bookings that, that are present. So we have, again, a, as we need, and, uh, and we've identified agenda items that will bring more people to the table to have the discussion. Um, there is, as I mentioned, the, the second group of individuals is the Joint Use Technical Committee. These are the ones that talk about the actual projects that happen on the school grounds, uh, playgrounds, the soccer posts, the maintenance. Those type of ideas. Uh, we have one representative from the city and one representative from each school board. Again, that's the official um, board. There's actually more like seven or eight people sitting around the room as we bring in the necessary individuals. Um, that the group in itself appoints um, a chair, 
and uh, and we call meetings as necessary as these projects come up. Um, this group deals with extensively, um, for, the, for the most part, the playgrounds um, uh, from the sc schools. The um, parent parent boards meet these individual uh, of schools. They come up with uh, fun funding ideas to have playgrounds expanded or, or developed for their schools. It comes to this group to work through the details to, to make that happen and to give them advice. Um, other responsibilities down the bottom of the page there, I, again, I'll go through it quickly. Um, as you can imagine, they have the formal responsibilities of creating a budget, creating a list of pri uh, priorities, uh, follow, uh, getting budget approval for, for, their, for their project, sorry, <laughs> technical aspects, um, having designs prepared, and then reporting back out. And probably most importantly, this committee communicates directly with the community groups themselves. It's not the Joint Use Committee that does it, it's the people that can give the answers, which is the joint, which is this technical committee. So they do deal directly with the public. Um, so, and that's their major role, and they provide all the documentation and letters that are required for grants, uh, for applying for money for different organizations that comes from this group. And All right, it's All right. Uh, my turn, Don Lucy here, uh, regarding construction of new schools. Um, provincial funding formula sets the infrastructure parameters uh, for schools, and one of those is gym size. And, uh, these parameters may meet school requirements, but not necessarily the community needs or facilities for sports competitions. So in the spirit of the joint use agreement, and to benefit students and the community, the city of Lethbridge directs municipal funding towards enhancement of new schools. Um, just as an example, the City of Lethbridge has provided funding to enlarge my new elementary school that's currently being built. Uh, they've put 750000 towards that expansion, and that uh, will increase the gym by 200 meters square, which will make it available uh, to sports competitions and better use for the community. Uh, as far as the uh, size of the school, School sites, uh, those are determined uh, jointly in collaboration with the city. And I must say that over my 21 years, we've, we've built a number of schools. We've never had an issue as far as, uh, as size of site, etc. Many school sites are a combination of uh, school sites and city parks, uh, and, and so are very large. Uh, one thing about the city is that there's so many trails and they flow through our, our school sites and through the parks, and it's just a nat natural transition. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, city to be in. Um, boards have the title to the school building site, which is usually around three meters around that particular site, including park lots, and joint title to the rest of the school site. And the rationale for the joint title to the rest of the school sites basically ties in with uh, if uh, you know somebody wants to come along and put an electrical box sort of thing, and, and so it could be a liability thing. So this way we sit down and we talk about those kind of things, and we work them out accordingly. The other neat thing about the city is that when, when we start to do our construction of our school site, the city moves in right away and starts building their fields. And so in that case, they can get two years of, of growth as far as the grass is concerned. And so that makes it much more able to stand up to the community and the school use in great shape when we take it over. So now I'm going to pass it back to Jason. Where is it, Barry? Yeah, thanks, Don. I just wanted to make, uh, Don has a, a, an example for 200 meters on a particular building here. It actually has a, a, a real reason why it's 200 meters. For the, uh, when the province sets their funding for in the United States in elementary school, the, the gym is usually fairly small in, in some respects. And the extra 200 meters gets it up to about the size of a um, middle school gym, I believe. And that's the size that we need for our community groups to have more, or more, commuter, more commu uh, community groups that can uh, access that facility in that regard. So that's one of the, that's probably the primary reason that we actually need to, uh, provide additional funding so we have more community access. All right, and uh, obviously, I mean, you've heard all the positives there. There's always challenges that go along with any one of these types of agreements, and uh, the City of Lethbridge and the school districts are no different. Um, we've sort of identified a few of the key ones here. These are by no means the only ones, but, uh, but uh, we'll touch on these ones just to, as warnings as to how, how we try to deal with things. Uh, our, our biggest challenge by far across the board in terms of booking this is, is getting all the individuals involved, the sports groups, the, the teachers, the principals, to understand that how the booking process works and to please use the booking process rather than going around the side and using the facilities on their own. Um, the key to this one really isn't 
the fact that they're using the facilities. The key to this one is actually the insurance, is that anybody using these facilities that aren't booking through the process, as we mentioned before, the city blanket insurance to everybody, those groups that are in there aren't covered by anybody. And so we're putting kids or adults or whoever at risk in those situations, and that's what we're trying to avoid as, as much as possible. Um, finding caretaking for the weekend activities. Um, obviously, the school districts are unionized staff, and those, those weekend times are overtime for any one of the, the caretaking staff that are working them, and therefore are, are um, optional for them. They don't have to work the weekends, so we, we rely on our relationship with them and the relationship with our groups to, to keep those weekend activities rolling forward. Um, there is definitely additional operating costs to school districts um, by having all these these groups in, in their schools in the weekends and and uh, in the evenings, uh, including the couple examples they have there with the gymnasium floors need to be refinished twice as often, and just having the lights on in some of these big gymnasiums uh, are some large costs. So, despite the fact that the school districts and this is one of the reasons why we changed our funding formula to put the money back to the school districts instead of spin, uh, splitting it 50-50, is they're taking on the additional costs. Uh, the city does the administration costs of staff in the, in the city hall, and that's true. But m many of the maintenance costs and, and the cost of running the lighting stays with the school district, so that's why they take the money back at the end. Um, and demand by the community is greater than any of the space we possibly can have available. Uh, it doesn't matter how many gyms and how many hours we open up, uh, there's always more, more requests than, than we can have available. Uh, for example, our basketball group in town right now, um, we only probably give them about 60% of the time that they're looking for. They run a full program with that, but that just shows the expansion level that they would go to um, if the space was available. So it's an incredibly popular and uh, positive development. So uh, Don was so kind to allow me to uh, uh, speak to this last slide here. Well, actually, I had to wrestle with him, but um, this to me is probably our most important slide because uh, Jason just commented around some of the challenges that we face and how we approach those challenges are because we have this common vision uh, and we actually have an operational process in place to allow us to work through the, any challenges. Um, basically, everybody on the team and over at the school boards uh, and school districts all have the same vision. And so we, when we do have a challenge, we say, well, everybody's around the room and it's saying, how can we get this accomplished, not how we cannot. And I think that's the only way to move forward in a collaborative way. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, so that was talking about the City of Lethbridge's joint um, and the school board's uh, joint use agreement model. So now we're going to go over and talk about the model that we're using in Lac Labiche. So I will turn things over to Stacy and Carol. Thank you, Kelly. Hello, everyone. I'm Stacey Latimer. I'm the Manager of Recreation and Culture with Lac Labiche County. Um, so this presentation, we were asked to kind of base it more on the county's and municipalities' perspective. However, because we do work closely with our representatives from Northern Lights School Division, we did consult them and we did get some feedback on their take and some of the things that they saw with the presentation as well, and we've included it into this. So we're going to kind of walk you through a history of how we led up to the joint use as well as the successes and challenges that we've had and then kind of some of the learning moments because ours is only a few years in the making so we don't have 40 years under our belts yet. All right. So just for those that aren't aware, uh, Lac La Biche, our little community profile, we're about 12,000 within our county limits. Um, we're about two and a half hours north e northeast of Edmonton, so kind of halfway to Fort McMurray for those on a, on a map. Um, obviously rely heavily on oil and service industry up there, tourism in the summers, definitely. And right now we have three public schools, one French immersion, two Francophone schools and a Phoenix Catholic school opening this fall. Um, J.A. Williams has roughly between five and 600 high school students. So why the joint use? I'm going to hand it, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Carol, now. Right. <coughs> Hi, everybody. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is Carol Gerard. I'm the business development coordinator at our multiplex, the Bold Center. Um, I have been involved from 2012, uh, drafting the actual joint use agreement, working with the committees, and working through the first year of its success. So just to talk about how we first started, uh, the municipality had been looking at getting a multiplex because we needed to close down some of our old buildings. We wanted new facilities, um, and the school division had approached us wanting to take part in this. They needed some new schools as well, and we could take advantage of economies of scale, um, get two projects underway at the same time, 
Um, we had a plebiscite done in 2012 asking residents if they supported a bar borrowing bylaw because we had to borrow up to 48 million to see this done. And over 70% of our residents voted in favor. So in May 2009, construction started. Um, as it turned out, they didn't, both projects did not get built at the same time. Uh, so the Bolt Center opened up in January 2011 and then the school opened up in September 2014. So, let's see. Uh, this helped to lessen the tax burden on ratepayers and we got to share construction costs of some of the common spaces and the ongoing operating costs of the facility. And one thing, we got two field houses in the end, which was an intricate factor because the school came on board. Otherwise, we only would have had one field house. So as I said, the Bolt Center opened up in January 2011. After that, a joint developed area committee was formed. Uh, we first started off with a ground lease. And that was a 50-year lease. So what happened is the school actually leased the land from the county and up to five meters around the building. And once the ground lease is finished after 50 years, the school is the property of the county, and unless it wasn't renewed. And after that, we did a joint use agreement. So the steering committee was formed in 2013. And I'll just pass on to Stacy just to give you an idea of what was all involved with the Bold Center. Yeah, so a lot of people ask why the Bold Center. Um, if anyone knows, Lacklevish is small, and um, we having this multiplex has added a lot of value um, and infrastructure to the county. Um, we have our, our tagline that's called Life Happens at the Bold Center. It's approximately 250,000 square feet. It's a one-stop shop for a lot of parents, a lot of sports, a lot of community groups and schools to be utilizing. Um, we provide diverse quality recreation, cultural, social opportunities, and promote healthy and active living while enhancing lifelong learning. Um, the Stuart McPherson Public Library is also kind of tucked in nicely between the school as well as the Bold Center. Um, we're one of the only multiplexes that has a, a dedicated boxing area. Um, we have food outlets. We have a community hall attached to us. So it does make perfect sense for having the schools attached as they have access to a lot more areas. So with the Joint Use Committee, we'll just review quickly um, who, whoops, who we had. Um, it, started it started off small. It changed several times, changed players, changed the scope. Um, but basically, we have Northern Light School Division reps. We have the secretary treasurer on the board there. We have the director of facilities. And then we have the principal with J.A. Williams High School, because they are the ones attached directly to us. Um, on the county side, we started off with our general manager of planning and community services. Um, again, that title has changed and the people have changed. Um, executive assistance to the GM, which is now our business development coordinator position. Um, myself as the recreation manager, and as well, we added our facilities manager once they came into play. Um, that's our steering committee. Like you guys, we've also developed our subcommittees um, to deal with specifics on the facility side, on the programming and scheduling side of things. And then we also have what we call kind of the conduct one with all the things that don't fall into any of those other categories where we can deal with things at, at both levels. So this is Carol again, um, just to talk about how we went about developing the joint use agreement. We started off um, just with a brainstorming session we were all very familiar with each other and had been worked on the other committees together. So we just went around round table. Everybody said what needed to be addressed in the joint use agreement. So how to share the space, how to figure out the cost, uh, school parking, lockdown procedures, all these different things we wrote down. Uh, we explored other municipalities' joint use agreements, did some research, um, drafted it up. And then we started going back and forth with solicitors and task force. Council did get involved at one point. Uh, they got to put in their input and made sure they were comfortable with it as well. Then the school opened up in September 2014. We weren't completely finished the agreement, but it gave us a chance to put it live and work out the kinks. So that was actually a positive. We made a few changes um, and then it was officially signed off October 28, 2014. So we always kind of went in this thinking that this is a living document, especially the first few years. We haven't had any experience with this. We needed to really be able to be flexible. Um, so the duration of developing it took about 15 months. 
there were four to five revisions. We did look at doing it sort of like City of Lethbridge did, where they took care of all the bookings for all the schools. But it's, it's after some discussion, it was just too much at once to take on. You're suddenly going to have you know, 500 students into the old center, which our community members were used to having all for themselves. And now they had to share the space with students, and students had to get used to you know, having their main gym as a part of a multiplex. So it took them getting used to. So the actual agreement was about 19 pages. And that was more the legalities and different things. What we really concentrated on were the schedules. And that was, we went pretty detailed because we wanted uh, um, some parameters to go around. We could change it later. But uh, for example, uh, some of it was, hold on, let me just switch the slide here. Um, sorry, this is just when they signed the agreement officially, the school board and the council. Where am I? Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so the joint use facilities, so the school field house two is as we call it. It's actually the equivalent of three full size gyms. That's what the school has from seven AM till three 30 p.m. daily. That's automatically theirs. And then from 3.30 till 6 p.m., they get two of the gyms in that field house. And we get the one for our drop-ins. And so we have different parameters on that, how to book, when we have to be booking. Um, we do split the cost of, this, of the utilities. However, we didn't do the 50-50 split. When we looked at it more closely, we did a formula based on usable hours. So for example, um, the school could use it from 7 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. And the county could use it from the weekend hours and all summer long minus, minus summer school. So it turned out the county did have more use of it. Um, so that's how we came up with 44-56 split. Um, we shared different capital costs, such as refinishing the gym floors. Um, we got a new score clock. So we split the cost of that because that was right in the field house. So those are just some examples of the schedules, which we can share with you. Booking procedures, healthy food choices, parking policies, et cetera. OK, as I said, this is just the official signing of the agreement. And Stacey can talk about some of the successes. OK. So when I first started at the Bold Center, January 2013, I have to say it was a little bit of a dead zone during the day. Um, that has changed dramatically. Uh, the community is really embracing the Bold Center, is really taking pride in the multiplex. We have increased vibrancy during the day. Um, there's just a buzz of activity all day long now, which is great to see. Um, we get more use out of our infrastructure. We're using a lot more of the spaces efficiently. So like we said, um, not having a lot of different facilities available within our area, they have access to two ice surfaces. They have access to curling, uh, four sheet curling rink. They have access to come in and do other things that they wouldn't normally get to do. Um, we work together on the sports fields, um, sharing the costs. And our members and our ratepayers as well get access to those types of additional value infrastructures um, as well. Um, for example, some of the tournaments events that we've had just currently on the, the slide here, we, d we just hosted three large badminton tournaments this month alone, where we had anywhere from 100 to 500 players coming um, from the, the middle school to the high school level. Um, our popular Wow Pow tournament every, held every October, we always have 40 or 50 teams in that tournament. The Pink Shirt Day, which is the anti-bullying um, event that happened a couple Februarys ago. We had over 900 children there that day. Um, and the party, the Preventing Alcohol-Related Trauma in Youth, um, again, has been historically um, held at the Bold Center. So the, the schools are, like the Lethbridge one, they're able to come and book our facilities during the day um, at little to no cost. Um, like they said, the access to the pool as well as the rinks are the higher cost for us. So we do have a nominal charge involved. Some of the other successes that we have, um, obviously the cost sharing, the money, and the new features. Um, we have, working together, been able to bring in all new features. Like Carol said, the new score clock. We've added padding to all of our um, the facility pools and volleyball net standards. 
Um, so that's been a great thing. Um, obviously, with some of the in incidents we've dealt with, we've also increased our safety measures. Um, so incident reporting, lockdown and emergency procedures, all those types of things take such more of a priority for us at this point. Um, we've done a lot of joint staff training and a lot of the training to bring staff to par with dealing with um, public as well as schools. Um, for example, at the end of May here, uh, the school board's putting on a threat uh, Threat risk assessment workshop um, that all of us will be attending as well so that we can uh, better understand some of the things that we're all dealing with. Um, increased communication and partnership has continued to evolve. We have a better appreciation of what each party has to deal with both on the funding level as well as the politics level. Um, how do decisions get made, how long decisions take to get made, and, and what the reins are that things have to go through. Um, it's also brought us closer together to working to strive to do common goals. So things like the field, the, the upgrades and that type of stuff is really nice to see. And the co-sponsorship, um, when we go out and we seek sponsorship or when the school does, again, we want to deal with that together. Um, sponsors are more likely to get involved when they see it. Um, more entities involved um, and we're both benefiting from that so some of the examples we have there is we are all of our fitness equipment is um, sponsored or provided by Apple Fitness uh, the school wants use of the track so we're working on a three-way partnership to say you know they'll prov they'll buy the equipment we'll maintain it as part of our service agreement our members get access to it the students get access to it it's a win-win-win all the way around some of the key opportunities, obviously, um, the business growth and leasing interest has increased as well once the school came on. On our booster juice in our main hallway, as well as our penalty box concession upstairs, are doing very well um, with all those students coming each day. Um, vending and ATM machines are also seeing an increase in revenues. Um, we've had lots of interest shown from anything from retail, massage, tanning, food outlets. Um, they all kind of want to get into the gold center now because it's, you know, doing well. Um, increased usage and exposure. Um, I didn't bring all our stats with us today, but obviously our membership rates, um, our numbers, the amount of rentals has kind of quadrupled since we first opened the doors in 2011. Our revenues have also seen a, a, a huge increase. And a lot of that is due to the school coming on because everyone's embracing it. Um, we've incorporated a corporate membership program which all the school teachers and all the county employees and all the businesses in town get to take advantage of. Um, we have a youth um, intro to weight training where again they can get early access to the, the space. And we're now incorporating laser tag as something, um, again, as it's a little bit of a one-off, but um, it's something that being in rural Alberta, we don't have the access to the city amenities, and that's something that, again, groups, youth groups, school groups, and everything are going to be able to take part of. So that's good to see. Um, with the construction, we obviously got more space. Um, we have bridging areas between the school um, and the, the bold center. So we've received an additional studio space, which has been great for the amount of fitness classes, yoga classes we have. We also have a 10,000 square foot and developed space um, right between the school. Um, we do have plans to, to develop it. Um, however, right now it is being used in the shell format for a variety of fitness classes. Um, we have held exams there, parent-teacher interviews, everything to firefighter testing, special events, and so on. So that's been a really good addition. Um, reciprocal use, um, like the City of Lethbridge had talked about, um, the schools have allowed our community groups and, and county programming as well to use uh, the four different school gyms, classrooms free of charge in the evenings and weekends. Um, the partnership growth, again, like I said with the sponsors, the relationship between, as the relationship with Northern Lights and, and the county progresses, um, more partnerships are continuing to flourish. The college is coming on board. We have Canadian Naturals, Devon Energy, Synovus, um, Apple Fitness. They're just a few of the different sponsors who have really kind of joined forces for funding as well as support. Um, they've come out and helped with programs. They've sponsored community free times. Um, and it's just a great thing to see for the community.
um, opportunities for the students for work experience. Um, they don't have to worry about busing anymore. Um, the Bold Center is kind of off on its own in the community. Um, it's not really accessible to the rest of the schools. They have direct access right, through, um, right to us now. So they come in anything from the fitness center, child mining, facility operations, things like that, which can lead to future employment. Uh, it's great on the job training. Um, increased activity levels and opportunities, again, um, with the whole component of physical literacy and trying to keep people active and all the strategies coming out. Um, students have the ad that advantage here of being attached to the Bold Center for leisure times and drop-in. Um, we've added a student fix time at, over the lunch hour so that they could come in and hit the ice. Um, we also, like I said, have that introduction to the weight room um, so they can get early access if they pass the course and a lot of those courses we run on those school Fridays so they can take advantage of it. Some of our key challenges that we found at our operating level, um, funding and politics are always um, some of the ones that are done, dealt with at a higher level. Um, but as you see in the picture here, we have um, this corridor that's sitting that has a big X through it. This is the main corridor that would connect the school and the Bold Center and it's still undeveloped. So right now all the students have to go outside and come around through our main doors which in the winter um, it's cold, it's messy, um, they just want to go outside so they're finding other ways through. Um, a simple hallway would have really made a lot of difference for us. Um, Politics and just the balancing the needs of ratepayers in the school, um, that's always a tricky one because we as a municipality hear the ratepayer side of it and you know, with our facility we're losing and, and we're not gaining more. Really they are gaining a lot more um, and as I said some of those partnerships that we're dealing with, um, that's coming to a solution now but um, some of the things that we had in the beginning. Um, those attitudes have already started to change just a year or two in, so that's nice to see. Um, unfinished spaces, again, um, we lack that common hallway, we lack the sports fields and some of the outdoor areas right now, so the peak seasons and the high busy times are a challenge for us as well as the school because we're all buying for the same, sm the same use of spaces. Um, no decisions have been made on the sports fields. We have had meetings. Um, both parties are optimistic that someday we'll see some sports fields there. Um, right now, a lot of the times they have to bus back over to the old site. So that's a bit of a struggle on the school side for sure. And then as I said, the conflicts during the, the peak times. Um, there are times where the schools has it booked to six or seven at night for basketball tournaments where they're using the whole full court, um, which means our programming takes a bit of a back seat. But having that reciprocal use and moving some groups around, um, it's just been different for us, but we're, we're working our way through it. Um, some of the other key challenges and that are turning into successes is we have unified policies and standards. So because we were all working independently before in our own little silos, we're now seeing things from a bigger picture and that we have to really communicate and have those things unified so we're all working together. Um, the 5% record rule, as always, you know, there's always that 5% that seem to like to do things their own way. Um, we've had skateboarding, smoking, um, fighting, arrests, things like that that you don't really expect that to happen, but you have to deal with it. So again, really ironclad plans and a lot of meetings um, to address the things as they come up um, have helped us. Um, obviously with more people, there's more wear and tear. Um, we've had increased incidents like in our parking lot, for example. We've had you know more vehicle damages, more break-ins. Um, we've dealt with that in the sense we need more security. We need to upgrade our security systems um, and that will help as well. And then the school has less privacy, um, again being in a multiplex, we've incorporated some privacy screens and some other things to kind of deal with that, but it, it's something that if you were in your own individual school, you wouldn't, it's not an open concept facility, you wouldn't have to deal with those things. And the just because mentality, 